Hi, everyone. Welcome to MGFA's Wellness Series webinar, Aligning Lifestyle Choices with Your Biological Clock to Optimize Well-Being. I'm Jenna Mvalo, and I'm the Director of Patient Advocacy and Community Engagement at the MGFA. Before we get things started, I wanted to let you know that today's session will be recorded and available online. If you have any questions, please type them in the Zoom Q&A question box located at the bottom of the screen and we'll answer them during the Q&A segment. I'd like to give special thanks to our sponsors. Alexion, Argenix, Stanson, and UCB. We've got a great presentation today, and now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Paul Smith, wellness physician at Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience. Dr. Smith, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jenna, uh, for your gracious introduction and good afternoon or morning to everyone, depending on where you're located. Here in Hawaii, uh, it's a little after nine in the morning. That being said, I'm wide-eyed and ready to go. Okay. Aligning lifestyle um, choices with your biological clock to optimize your well-being is the topic of my uh, talk today. And I thank you all for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about lifestyle medicine and the area of medicine that's steadily growing in importance in our approach to patients that are dealing with a chronic condition. Next. By definition, lifestyle medicine is the use of evidence-based therapeutic lifestyle changes such as whole food, plant-based diet, regular physical activity, good sleep hygiene, stress management, social connections, and avoidance of risky substances such as tobacco and alcohol, and pursuing other non-drug modalities to treat sometimes reverse and prevent recurrence of chronic disease. It really aims at addressing the root cause of disease. Next. If we only see the full manifestation of chronic disease as the tree above ground, and direct our medications, procedures, and surgeries to only the branches we distinctly see as unhealthy, then we miss the opportunity to trace the real cause of the disease in the underlying roots. The root cause could be inflammatory or inadequate sleep, or maybe a sedentary lifestyle. I could even, it could even be a combination of multiple lifestyle adjustments that need to be made. Next. In a frequently quoted study written up uh, by the Mayo Clinic proceedings in 2016, they found that less than 3% of Americans have a quote, healthy lifestyle defined by four qualifications moderate or vigorous exercise for at least 150 minutes a week, a diet score in the top 40% of the healthy eating index, and the body fat percentage under 20% for men or 30% for women, and not smoking. The Mayo Clinic study is just one way of thinking a healthy lifestyle. Next. Aligning our lifestyles to these six pillars, good nutrition, adequate sleep, regular daily movement, no tobacco use, and minimizing alcohol use, the ability to recognize your stress response and develop coping mechanisms, and finally, to maintain social connections for love and support can also result in a light in a healthy lifestyle and well-being. Next. When you look at the health spectrum, most of us live our lives between the center of the spectrum and leftward to illness. 
Wellness is an individual pursuit. We have self-responsibility for our own choices, behaviors, and lifestyles. But it is also significantly influenced by the physical, social, and cultural environments in which we live. Wellness is often confused with terms such as health, well-being, and happiness. While there are common elements among them, wellness is distinguished by referring to a static state of being, being happy, in good health, or a state of well-being are just some of the terms. Rather, wellness is associated with an active process of being aware and making choices that lead toward an outcome of optimal holistic health and well-being. Next. The Global Wellness Institute defines wellness as the active pursuit of activities, choices, and lifestyles that lead to a state of holistic health. There are two important aspects to this definition. First, wellness is not a passive or static state, but rather an active pursuit, that it is associated with intentions, choices, and actions as we work toward an optimal state of health and well being. Second, wellness is linked to holistic health. That is, it extends beyond physical health and incorporates many different dimensions that should work in harmony, such as the social, mental, and spiritual. Next. One way to understand wellness is to consider health as a continuum that extends from illness to a state of optimal well-being. On one end, patients with poor health engage the medical paradigm to treat illnesses. They interact reactively and episodically with doctors and clinicians who provide care. On the opposite end, people focus proactively on prevention and maximizing their vitality. They adopt attitudes and lifestyles that prevent disease, improve health, and enhance their quality of life and sense of well being. In other words, wellness is proactive, preventive, and driven by self responsibility. Next. That being said, I would like to focus on four topic areas that hopefully will assist you in understanding a little better what may be a root cause of MG in terms of bioenergetics and circadian rhythms. Also, how you can make choices in your intake of nutri nutrients and performance of daily activities to progress toward optimal well being. Next. The animation, propagation, and preservation of life resides in our cells. Next. Estimates of the number of cells in our body range in the neighborhood of 35 trillion cells. If about 10,000 cells can fit on the head of a pin, then three and a half billion times that number of cells compose your body. The statement that we live and die at the cellular level relates to the fact that our health is directly related to the healthy function of each of those 35 trillion cells. The health of the individual cell is very much determined by the steady diet of energy which is supplied by the mitochondria organelles within the cell. Next. The process of cellular respiration animates the cell, providing it with the energy, energy needed to perform its tissue specific functions. 
The little mitochondria organelles are the ever-ready batteries within the cell, generating the needed energy through conversion of our intake of three macronutrients, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. ATP is the compound which, when the phosphate chemical bonds are broken, releases biochemical energy utilized by the cell. Glucose combined with oxygen is the primary source of production of ATP within the mitochondria. Next. When there's insufficient oxygen available to combine with the glucose, the cell undergoes anaerobic glycolysis outside of the mitochondria to create two molecules of ATP. It also results in the byproduct lactic acid. As you can see, within the mitochondria and with sufficient oxygen, combining with glucose in a chemical process termed oxidative phosphorylation, about 34 ATP molecules are produced. Mitochondria make 90% of the body's energy. The more energy a cell type needs, the more mitochondria they have. The cell types with the most mitochondria are liver, brain, heart, and kidney. Next. Mitochondria are complex bean-shaped organelles find, found in almost every cell of the body. Mitochondria make up about half of our dry body weight. Young adults produce their body weight in ATP every single day. Unfortunately, this declines as we age. Next. Functions of the mitochondria include production of ATP, regulation of immunity, immunity, uh, calcium balance, cell death and renewal, and stem cell regulation. When mitochondria function or become dysfunctional, energy production plummets. Research suggests damaged mitochondria play a role in many diseases. Neurological and neuromuscular diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, and hearing loss. Autoimmune diseases like MG, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. Metabolic diseases and conditions like type 2 diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and stroke, and some forms of cancer. Over 200 conditions are known to be associated with poor mitochondrial function. Next. Mitochondria generate 90% of the free radicals in your cells as they make ATP. Normally, the mitochondria also produce antioxidants that chemically neutralize the free radicals, but as the cell ages and mitochondrion become damaged, more free radicals are produced and antioxidant production is insufficient to neutralize the radicals, resulting in further mitochondrial and cellular damage. Next. I share this slide to give you an idea of the extent of organ systems affected by mitochondrial dysfunction and the myriad of symptoms and signs that can present. And you can see uh, it's pretty extensive. And this is just a, a limited showing of, of the things that can be affected. Next. All is not lost. We can improve the health of our mitochondria and cells through making good choices in what we eat and staying active. Next. Start thinking about how you can improve the function and survival of your cells 
by making better lifestyle choices. Next. I would like to introduce the concept of homeostasis within our bodies, that internal body within our body systems and organs. Next. Three components interact to maintain a stable operating condition within our bodies. For example, if the ambient temperature is cool and that's a stimulus, your body temperature falls. Temperature sensitive cells in the skin and brain receptors relay information to the thermal regulatory center in the brain which is the integrator, which sends a signal to your skeletal muscles, which are the effectors, causing shivering, which in turn causes the rise of your body temperature, which is the response to the homeostatic set point. If the ambient temperature is too warm, again, the stimulus, your body temperature rises, Temperature sensitive cells in the skin and the brain, the receptors, relay information to the thermal regulatory center in the brain, which signals your sweat glands, the effectors, to activate sweating and the evaporation of sweat, causing your body temperature to fall. Again, the response back to an imbalance at 98.6 degrees. The change that results from the response to the stimulus is fed back to the receptor. In this example, a negative feedback loop is created because the response of the system cancels or counteracts the effect of the original stimulus. Next. And this is just another illustration of that uh, same concept, uh, just kind of giving you uh, a little more of a graphical look on the left-hand side there of kind of what I just read through. Okay, next. The homeostasis of our autonomic nervous system is important in maintaining the balance between our sympathetic and parasympathetic branches. As you may recall, our sympathetic system is probably better known as the fight or flight response. The sympathetic system can also stimulate the release of powerful inflammatory agents and a stress response. Prolonged overstimulation of the sympathetic system can lead to chronic inflammation and a chronic stress response. Next. The parasympathetic system counteracts or relaxes the actions of the sympathetic system. If your heart rate increases under sympathetic stimulation, then it will be decreased under parasympathetic stimulation. Relaxation techniques, deep breathing, and meditation work by utilizing the principle of homeostasis of the autonomic nervous system to manage stress. Next. <clears throat> this homeostatic control extends from the mitochondria to our individual cells to the to the level of multiple organ systems of our body. It begs the question, what keeps our homostatic functions under control? Next. What is the fundamental driver of our health? These verses from the biblical book of Genesis may be a good starting point. Genesis 1, 3 through 5 states, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, 
that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. The daily light darkness cycle caused by the Earth's 24 hour rotation on its annual journey around the sun is the strongest cue directing our internal biological rhythms. These 24 hour cycles are termed circadian rhythms from the Latin word circa meaning about and dia meaning day. All plants and animals are attuned to this cycle. Next. When we eat, what we eat, how active we are, when we sleep and when we wake up are controlled by our biological clock, which in turn controls the energy homeostasis in our cells. Next. Uh, don't get too freaked out by this slide, but <laughs> I thought it was a great representation of uh, just kind of how this process works. The photic Zeitgeber, which is a German word, um, and basically it means a cue, is the strongest external cue for entrainment or synchronizing our internal clocks to external cues. Or, yeah. And uh, there's also non photic Zeitgebers. Um, the master clock synchronizes with the peripheral and cellular clocks or oscillators, which in turn feedback signals to the master clock to maintain synchronization. Non photic cues such as our sleep wake cycle, our level, our, our, uh, and our level and timing of physical activity our timing of our meals and socialization are additional external cues that entrain our internal or endogenous circadian rhythms. Next. I present this slide to give you uh, an idea of the organ systems governed by a circadian cycle and the disorders that can manifest when that cycle is disrupted. Most of us have probably experienced the unpleasantness of jet lag, which is a mild to moderate example of disruption. I want to point out that the nervous system disruption manifesting in sleep disorders, mood disorders, and neurogenitive, neurogenerative disease. Uh, disruption of the immune circadian cycle can result in autoimmune disorders or exacerbate existing conditions of an organ system. The good news is that there is hope. The more we learn about the amazing cycles and the inner relationships, the better our understanding and knowledge that we can share with you about making the necessary lifestyle changes for optimizing your wellness. Next. The master clock is truly at the center of it all. It signals primarily direct communications to the autonomic nervous system and the release of the stress hormone cortisol. The endocrine system and the release of many other hormones that in turn control the activity of other organs. It's signal to the pineal gland to release melatonin, which in which the melatonin release is the signal to the brain and other peripheral clocks to prepare for sleep and reduce core body temperature. Our sleep habits, activity level, and dietary in turn become feedback cues to the master clock in making adjustments to our individual cycles. Next. Uh, this is kind of a busy slide, but mainly what I want to relay to you is that the daily release of melatonin 
and cortisol are inverse to each other. The peak of melatonin release signals sleep progressively in progressively deeper stages of non-REM sleep that is broken about every 90 to 110 minutes by REM sleep. Cortisol, on the other hand, slowly rises through the night as melatonin is declining and resulting in a cortisol spike that ushers in the morning awakening. Timing your breakfast about half an hour after you wake up helps your master clock and train to that awakening time. Next. The protective and regulatory effects of melatonin. Um, this is why it's so important to get or to generate good sleep habits. Um, the regular release of melatonin has a strong influence in protecting our immune system and stimulation of antioxidants. Next. <clears throat> when the master clock signals the release of melatonin into the circulation, the gut, the liver, the pancreas, the immune system, brain, and other organs are signaled to bring food intake and energy expenditure into homeostasis. This is from the ma macro view of the process and directed by our lifestyle behaviors relating to eating, activity, sleep, and light exposure. We've previously discussed the importance of the mitochondria's role in energy homeostasis at the cellular level. Mitochondria operate on a circadian cycle. Next. Uh, a lot going on with this slide, but basically time of day interacting with an individual's master clock in the brain can have a profound impact upon performance and health through disruption of the circadian system. Flying across multiple time zones and shift work have significant economic benefits, but the cost in terms of Ill health are only now becoming clear. Sleep and circadian rhythm disruption is almost always associated with poor health. Regular circadian physiological outputs include our sleep-wake cycle, body temperature, blood pressure, blood glucose, and heart rate, energy homeostasis, metabolism, hormone release, mood and behavior changes. Jet lag is the most obvious example of what can happen when the circadian system is disrupted and local time and internal time are not properly aligned. Crossing more than three or four time zones in a jet aircraft uncouples these rhythms from the natural light dark cycle and from each other. The various rhythms exhibit what's called internal dyssynchrony. Disrupted circadian homeostasis includes medical problems such as sleep disorders, medical disorders or metabolic disorders, cancers, cardiovascular de disease, and other things uh, along the lines of, uh, again, there's a good indications that uh, the neurological, a lot of the neurological problems such as Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, Parkinson's all relate to this. Next, please. Aligning or entraining external cues with your internal cycles uh, starts by practicing good sleep hygiene. And that includes choose a set bedtime. About an hour before bedtime, prepare yourself for sleep by turning down the house lights, turning off blue light devices and TVs, phones, iPads, no caffeine or alcohol in the evening, at minimum three hours prior to the intended sleep time. 
begin to relax, maybe with soft music or ocean sounds or deep breathing, meditation. And you want to target about seven to eight hours of sleep each night. You should wake up feeling refreshed and alert. Another thing is get outdoors and soak up sunshine and fresh air. Sunlight is over 100 times the intensity of home lighting. Next. Let food be thy medicine and medicine thy food was quoted by someone, but it's doubtful it was Hippocrat <laughs> Hippocrates. Regardless of who gets the credit, the aphorism is still valid. Next slide, please. An NPR poll surveyed a nationally representative sample of 3,000 adults in 2016. One of the questions asked was, how healthy would you consider your eating habits to be? About 75% of respondents ranked their diets as good, very good, or excellent. The fact is, more than 80% of Americans fail to eat the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables on a daily basis. Next slide. Nearly half of all deaths due to heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes are linked to diet and poor nutrition. Diet has become the largest root cause for driving chronic disease rates and death in the US. Food as medicine is no longer viewed as a preventive measure. It, along with medicines or surgery, can be prescribed as an intervention for the treatment and sometimes even reversal of disease. If a poor diet caused the problem, a healthy diet can help correct the problem. Next slide, please. Three macronutrients fuel our bodies, carbohydrates, fats, protein. And we know that the mitochondria are responsible for the conversion of those macronutrients into energy. Glucose, a simple carbohydrate, has preference over complex carbohydrates, which in turn have preference over fats. Protein is only utilized for fuel when carbohydrates or fat are not readily available. If there isn't enough energy expenditure, surplus carbs and fat get shunted to fat storage. Next slide, please. Resveratrol, um, you, in, in terms of foods that are helpful or, uh, well, healthy for your mitochondria, the resveratrol, uh, which is found in things like grapes, red and white wine, peanuts, pistachios, blueberries, cranberries, uh, cocoa, dark chocolate. Um, many foods contain alpha lipoic acid uh, in very low amounts. Um, but the main major foods that contain it are spinach, broccoli, yams, potatoes, uh, Brussels sprouts, carrots, beets, Omega-3, uh, we know, especially cold water fatty fish, such as salmon, mackerel, tuna, herring, sardines. Um, nuts and seeds also can be a source, such as flax seed, uh, chia seeds, and walnuts. And also plant oils, uh, flaxseed oil, soybean oil, canola oil. The L-carnitine, um, mostly red meat, you're gonna find the highest uh, levels. 
And, but you do find smaller amounts in chicken, milk, and dairy products, fish, beans, and avocado. And the main thing that I'm trying to get across with um, these two pictures is really the mitochondrial health comes down to because in the energy production, the free radicals are produced uh if the mitochondria is not able to keep up with that free radical production you need added antioxidants to help neutralize the free radicals and so the foods the that i just mentioned and also micronutrients such as vitamin a vitamin e the carotenoids uh, coenzyme q10 are also very good ways of bringing additional antioxidants into the body. Next slide, please. The truth of the matter is that the more colorful the assortment of vegetables and fruits throughout the day, the more assured you can be about getting antioxidants to your cells. And, you know, I thought that, um, the <clears throat> these really these two slides just really kind of um grasp the the real essence of what it's all about is really we want that antioxidant and if you think about eating the rainbow or just the diversity of colors that are in fruits and vegetables and you make it a point to eat as much as you can uh, on a daily basis, you'll be all right. Next, please. And really, it's not short looking at a short term diet or any kind of special diet. It's really looking at this in a long term lifestyle changing way, changing your behaviors. Next. And I know this is an embellishment, but yet it speaks the truth. We are what we eat. Next. And I'm not trying to start a physics lesson, but uh, I think Newton had it right in the sense that um, you know, motion movement is really at the heart of our health. Um, I think that the more active we can be, and in that, I'm not saying you have to get out, go to the gym, or you have to, you know, take this kind of sweat producing aerobics class that just leaves you soaked every time. But I think the importance of getting up at least about every 30 minutes, just moving around for a minute or two can have far reaching benefits in terms of your overall health. So just think about it in terms of keeping some kind of movement motion in your body throughout the day and you know it's not so much you have to worry about these guidelines of uh you know exercise it's more about keeping your body active next slide between the ages of 18 and 55, the average sedentary American gains between 17 and 20 pounds of fat. Between 55 and 65, we gain another two to five pounds of fat. This gradual accumulation of body fat is accompanied by redistribution of fat to the central area, mainly around um, our bellies and uh, also internally around the organs. And most of this starts really accumulating during our middle age. 
We also experience a loss of muscle called sarcopenia uh, during our middle age and older. And these changes cause a domino effect. As you gain fat weight and lose muscle mass, your metabolism slows, causing you to gain more weight. And although most of us know the benefits of physical activity, few of us are sufficiently active. In fact, research shows that more than 80% adults do not meet minimal guidelines for recommended physical activity, and as many as 34% of older adults are completely inactive. What is, what is it that gets us moving? And a fundamental component is motivation, the desire and the will to do something. And again, that's what I would emphasize is just generating that desire and will to get up and do something, get up and move. Those activities in and of themselves have a beneficial health uh, promotion. Next, please. Uh, on the left-hand side, the metabolic pyramid, I present to show you that uh, the basal metabolic rate, it, it really actually is the resting metabolic rate uh, when we're doing nothing other than either just sitting calmly or uh, sleeping, you actually, uh, it actually represents almost 60% of our total daily energy expenditure. So when you get up to actual physical activity like exercise, exercise may be like another 10, 15% of our total daily energy expenditure, but the rest of that is really in terms of what's called NEAT, non exercise uh, activity uh, thermogenesis. And finally, the TEF or thermic effect of feeding or food, uh, that's just the energy that's utilized by our intestines for the digestion of food. So what is NEAT and why is it important? Um, because sometimes I think these guidelines and we get so focused on, uh, boy, you know, meeting that guideline and meeting the, um, minimum with that guy based on that guideline that we sometimes end up becoming demotivated because if we're not reaching it, at our expectation, like every day or however many times you expect or tell yourself you're going to exercise, you can become very disappointed and disheartened with yourself and just kind of give up. But the reality is that really uh, non-exercise activity, just the things you do around the house, the movements, when you're doing your housekeeping, when you may be outside gardening or walking the dog, all of those things really are count in that activity tabulation. So I, I just, you know, really emphasize that, that uh, don't let guidelines and everything uh, dissuade you from being active in movement at your home or again, it's great if you can go outside and soak up that sunshine and fresh air to really kind of give you that total body, uh, hey, healthy makeover. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, you know, I just talked about guidelines. <laughs> Um, these are the physical activity guidelines, but uh, I, I like this quote by 
Albert Einstein, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. And, and that's the message that, uh, you know, I, I really would give to you uh, about physical activity, you know, think about that balance in the mitochondria, in your circadian rhythms, and movement is an essential part of that equation, that homeostasis within our bodies in terms of maintaining health and wellness. Next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, again, is kind of a busy slide, but the main takeaways from it is that uh, if you look at the kind of um, rectangles with, that apply to the mitochondrial adaptation, uh, when you exercise, the mitochondria respond in a very positive way with increased uh, glucose and fatty acid oxidation, increase uh, in the antioxidants that are produced, and an increase in actually new mitochondria being produced. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, that in turn, um, we also look at if you're able to maintain that the mitochondria become much more functional and more efficient. Next slide, please. And really, you know, some of the benefits from regular exercise activity, um, I like improved quality of life, um, you know, reduction of stress and anxiety, um, maintaining a good blood pressure. With diabetes, it helps in uh, your muscles having uh, better insulin sensitivity and therefore able to uh, uptake the glucose and utilize it uh, as energy. And then uh, the improvement in sleep. Uh, when you are active, usually you'll find you sleep better. Um, Long-term benefits, Definitely, I'm looking at as I'm aging, uh, reducing the risk of dementia and also um, keeping in mind strong muscles to help with balance and reducing the risk of falls. Um, and kind of what I alluded to before in terms of disease management, um, especially with diabetes, but also uh, mood uh, conditions such as depression, stress, and anxiety, uh, and neurological conditions, MS, um, Parkinson's. Next slide, please. So, with lifestyle medicine, it really comes down to, you know, these six areas or six pillars that we kind of emphasize and try to really help patients tune into. And just simply put, eat plants, whole food, plant-based diet, keep moving, we just talked about, good sleep, uh, be present. And what I mean by be present, you don't need alcohol, drugs, uh, any mood changers. Usually, you know, the old saying in my time was, hey, I'm high on life. And when you have that better quality of life, uh, it does give you uh, a certain high. Stay calm managing your stress, coping techniques for managing your stress in terms of deep breathing, meditation, uh, really seek those out. Uh, and one of the most important things is being able to identify uh, 
um, your, your stress response. And then I really like love people, your social connections, you know, those that support you, love you, really cherish that because it is vital to our, our health and well being. Uh, next slide, please. And just, you know, that's it. It's really mind, body, spirit. That it all connects, it all goes together in terms of our health and wellness. Next slide. So what I would like you to take from this is really that optimizing our health and wellness begins at the cellular level. An energy balance or homeostasis is vital for our cells to function properly. What we eat, when we eat, and how active we are determine energy homeostasis. And our lifestyle choices affect the daily cycles of sleep-wake, rest activity, feeding, fasting. These rhythms are the primary promoters of good health and wellness. Next slide, please. And I thank you all very much for this opportunity. Jenna, I turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um, we have a couple of questions, so we'll get to those. Um, the first one is, why do you suggest eating breakfast 30 minutes after waking and how specifically does it help us? Uh, so it's really in terms of that concept of entrainment or kind of synchronizing the external cue, um, you know, let's say when you wake up, uh, windows are open, sunlight coming in, and that's kind of the external cue to um, your brain through the master clock, which is called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, uh, that, okay, those cortisol levels are rising, that spike of the cortisol is really what prompts you to wake up. So cortisol also plays a very vital role in how glucose is re released in our bodies. And so timing your breakfast, especially if you're eating a lot of carbs at breakfast, uh, about 30 minutes helps to make that connection again, or entrainment with wakening and then breakfast. And that kind of helps to synchronize or reset the circadian rhythms, or let me say, keep it aligned. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, this next one is any tips for avoiding jet lag or overcoming it quickly? Uh, okay, so there's definitely a difference from going eastbound. Uh, here in Hawaii, we, we deal with it <laughs> quite a bit, especially the eastbound uh, direction. Um, <clears throat> the eastbound is harder because, you, let's say, here it's 9.55, and over there, what, it's 3.55 in the afternoon. So let's say all of my external cues relate to here right now. When I get on that plane and I fly over to College Park, Maryland to visit my son, um, I have to prepare myself ahead of time. Uh, I try to start... Um, you know, a few weeks ahead of time, maybe about two weeks ahead of time, gradually shifting to that earlier time period, because that's going to be the disconnect is if I just jump on the plane right now, fly to the East Coast, I'm still on Hawaii time. My internal clocks are going to regulate the hormones, everything to Hawaii time. 
And so that melatonin that's released, it doesn't get released. So, uh, but yet <laughs> at say eight o'clock in the morning, Eastern time, if I'm still back, <laughs> you know, six hours later, two o'clock in the morning, Hawaii time, there's a real disconnect or disynchrony. And so that's why it's important to try to gradually, a few weeks before you make the flight, if it's eastbound to change. Westbound usually isn't a, uh, that bad because you're actually, uh, when I fly back here, I can kind of, you know, not, feel the effect as much because um, I'm on Eastern time, but now westward, um, I still am six hours behind. So my body is when I leave in the morning on the East Coast and I arrive back here in Hawaii evening time, I'm like ready to start the next day. It's kind of like I have these added hours that I can get up early and like go at it uh, because my body's still trying to catch up, so to speak. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. So you talked a lot about nutritional wellness and how that affects the cells on a on a, a level. How about fluid intake? Definitely water, uh, and that's one of the things that I'm bad at. You know, uh, well, there's there's a lot of thought on that. Um, I would say trying to uh, get eight glasses in in a day. Uh, if you can do that, fantastic. Please email me <laughs> what I need to do. <laughs> uh, but yes, that, that's something that um, I am striving for to change in my lifestyle is drinking more water. But hey, other things also count as fluid. Uh, unsweetened tea and is is a nice one, and especially if you know you make it green tea, uh, that's part of your fluid balance. So great, thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for your presentation and for helping us learn more about wellness. Um, thank you everybody for participating today and for the questions. Today's uh, session will be recorded and available on the MGFA website within the next couple of days. So if you go to the wellness series landing page, you'll be able to find it there once available. Thank you so much for the invitation, Jenna. And, you know, I thank you uh, in the MG community um, and you know, the main thing with the lifestyle changes is I think it gives us all hope in terms of, hey, a better life the next day, you know, one day at a time and just keep at it. Well said. Thank you. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye.